Why are you guys friends? I don't know. I think we all just kind of match each other's energy. We got kind of crazy vibes going on, but then at the end of the day, we can come back together and, uh, you know, be homies. Mm -hmm. Personally, these friends are like super great influences on me, and we kind of build off each other. And without them, I wouldn't really have that. Um, I'd kind of be on my own. For me, honestly, I probably wouldn't be a Christian without these guys because, uh, you know, it was kind of rough getting going, meeting people, but I started meeting all the guys and that's really where it began. It's just constantly <laughs> laughing and taking nothing seriously, really. Yeah, I feel like it's like an injection of, like, caffeine or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think God gives us the ability to, like, laugh with each other so we can build strong relationships like us. I mean, we wouldn't be as close as we are now if we weren't goofing off all the time and becoming closer friends and with that like you said we're able to grow our faith as well uh, yeah. everything was all serious it'd be like kind of just a boring life but, yeah. it'd be hard to be a christian if we have to be serious all day that's what people don't realize is you don't have to be a serious person always on reading the bible every second of the day you know it's okay to be goofy it's good yeah it's good to laugh things off i mean god created us to laugh and have fun right. i mean he would yeah. make laughing and having friends fun if they, you know, <laughs> right. it wasn't yeah. for a reason I was over by a Italian place in Monterey here, and outside at a table were about six or seven high school guys, some of those guys, with their Bibles open, studying the Bible together. They love Jesus, but they also crack up, have a lot of fun, and enjoy each other. And as we walk through this series that we're in right now about how to make every relationship in our lives better, we have to understand that God cares about relationships. When people ask Jesus what's important, all the most important in all the universe, he said, love God, love people, relationships. And so we've been talking about how communication, two weeks ago, communication makes every relationship better. Last week, Pastor Sean talked about how forgiveness will make every relationship better. Because listen closely, if you're in a serious relationship and you're honest, at some point, they're going to need to forgive you for something you did or didn't do. And you're going to need to forgive them. You cannot have a close relationship and not have stumbles along the way. You need forgiveness. And in this five-week series, another one of those key things that will make every relationship better is fun, laughter, celebration, delight, joy. And don't start parsing and you know, defining, well, joy means a certain thing. I mean joy in the sense of just taking celebration for the good gifts of life. And so I want you to listen to this passage. I'm not going to, I'll read it again and we'll have it up on the screen. I just want you to listen to this passage from Psalm 126. This is one of the Psalms of Ascent. These are the songs that God's people sang as they went up to worship. From Psalm 120 for, for a whole, there's this whole cluster of Psalms that are all about going up to meet with God. And this one particular Psalm says this. Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes, fortunes of Zion, that was the holy city. We were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Laughter, singing, joy. Living God speak to our hearts today. Wherever we are, whether we're online on the other side of the planet, whether we're sitting right here in the worship center or out in the courtyard or the family worship venue, wherever we are today, I pray you would meet with us and help us to see that your joy, your delight, celebration, laughter, fun are actually part of what it means to follow you. That of all the people in the world, those who have met Jesus Christ can have the biggest smiles, the heartiest laughs, the greatest joy. Speak your truth to our hearts today and deepen and strengthen and make more healthy every relationship in our lives. We pray this in the glorious, beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. There's something wonderful about seeing people have fun. Have you ever sat around a table playing a game with friends or watched somebody else playing a game and you just watch the laughter and the fun? You know, in, unless it's Monopoly until it gets to that tough point where somebody gets, you know, totally, totally loses it. But up to that point, you know. Having fun, laughing. Have you ever watched children together just doing, doing simple things? Go to the next slide there. Uh, uh, 
Have you ever seen children just doing nothing in particular and yet in the midst of it just laughing and having fun, that, that childlike delight in life? And that carries through so often around food. Have you ever been around a table with friends and just enjoying good food and enjoying good conversation and enjoying laughter? And some of you are like, I wish I had more of that. Some of you are like, I used to have that, but our world's gotten so weird that it's hard just to have the kind of fun I used to have. I, things have become so tense. The, the, the air in the ball has gotten so full. You've got to go, a little bit of air, little air out of the ball, lighten up a little bit. Uh, parents and grandparents with grandkids or children together laughing, having fun, sharing life. There's something about joy, fun, laughter, delight, celebration that honors God. This passage I read a moment ago, I'm going to read it again. It won't be on the screen yet. I'm going to read it three times today, and I want you to hear it again. And I want you to have a little context here. This particular psalm is looking back to a really tough time, a time of exile, a time of struggle, a time of difficulty. And out of that, the people were set free. They were released. They were brought back together again. And that brought joy. Every passage we're going to look at today has a balance of the fact that life can be hard, but we can still be people of delight. We can face challenges and still smile and laugh. We can face the reality of the pain that, that our world is filled with and still take delight that God is on the throne and he loves us. And so this passage begins with these words. This is Psalm 126, 1 through 3. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, that the, the city of God had gone through a hard time, the people had been exiled, but when the Lord restored that, brought things back together again. What happened to us? We were like people who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. We couldn't not sing songs of joy. It was so great to have come through that and then be on the other side of it. Then it was said among the nations. All the world was looking on saying, the Lord has done great things for them. Then the psalmist says, the Lord has done great things for us. It's like, man, I recognize what God has done. And we are filled with joy. Remembering the past, remembering the pain, even facing what is right now or what might lie ahead. There's still room for delight. There's still room for joy for those who have met Jesus. As a young Christian... Uh, I, I, was, I came out of a non-Christian home, and one of my first jobs, I actually had to start this job before I was 16. I was, my brother was a manager at 7-Eleven, kind of a high-tech, really important job I had uh, there, and I'd stock the freezer, do some different things, but I also worked behind the register and did a night shift, and when I would get bored, because sometimes there'd nobody, nobody would come in for 10, 15 minutes, there, was a, there used to be a 7-Eleven, I don't know if there's any more, but there was a little, little spot about this wide, you know, about so wide, and about this deep with three shelves of toys. And when I get bored, I'd go find a toy to play because I was bored. And that was one of the places I learned to spin a Frisbee. That helped me, get my, help, helped me get my first job at a pizza place. That was where I learned to juggle. My, uh, I taught three, high, uh, three uh, the, our tech kids this morning how to juggle. They, they're, they're masters already. They'll show you after the service. Ask, the, ask if they're carrying a camera, and I probably taught them to juggle. But, uh, so if you want to learn to juggle, you just start with one. Oh, that bright light's going to make it challenging. Then you can add another one. And then you just throw it up and you rotate through like that. There you go. <laughs> and I, so I, I would just find things to do to play because I was bored. This is before I could do this. For hours and, you know, just stare at a screen and do a thing. This is back when you had to get a little more creative with your, with your free time. Uh, in our family... We've always been, we tried to create, when our, we, our boys are now in their 30s, but, you know, games, times to play as a family. And Sherry and I play every night or every day. We, we, this, this is our game basket. This is our real basket from our houses. You can't take it. You can't have it. But in here is our cribbage board. I'm not going to say who's ahead right now, but that's my peg right there, two ahead of Sherry's. And, uh, and I only say that because usually she beats me. So I, but it's not over yet. There's still, i got to win three more to win this thing. And we actually, this new game... QWIX, I think it's called Quix. It's Mensa approved, and so if you know what that means. Um, it's a dice game where you keep score, and it's a lot of fun. This game we're into right now, right, honey? And so Sherry was gone, and I was gone. We were apart from each other. I was in the last part of my sabbatical. We were apart for a few days, came back, and she said to me, we got to play a game. And we kept playing our Quix game. And then when we went to New Zealand as part of the first part of our sabbatical, uh, we had dinner with five or six couples, different couples at different times that we had dinner with. And one couple, uh, been through a kind of a stretch of a lot of stuff going on in life and ministry. And we said, hey, can we teach you a new game? And we taught them how to play this game. 
And they, when they were going to come over for dinner where we were staying, they said, can we bring our daughter? And they got a daughter who's in high school. They, and I, I said, your daughter wants to come and hang out with four, you know, old people in ministry kind of thing? And they said, yeah. And so that's their daughter right there. Uh, and, and he sent me a text. I got it at 2.40 this morning from New Zealand. And he said, we've been, we've been playing the game you taught us. And it's, it's approved by our family, he said. And he said, every time we play that game, we also stop. And I don't think I showed this with you yet, honey. I got that, got that this morning when I woke up. He said, every time we play, we also stop and pray for the Harneys. And, and so just, just having fun playing together should be part of our lives. And then you go, you go through seasons. So like it used to be juggling Frisbee, that kind of stuff. You want to know one of the most fun things for me in the world is these days? To be able to take a pitching wedge. I'm gonna, I got somebody in the back that's going to catch this. I'm so good. I trust myself. Take a pitching wedge. Hit a nice little lob. I missed. Uh, and if you've ever played golf, if you hit a chip shot, it lands on the green, rolls close to the hole, and stops or goes in the hole. Oh, delight! Golfers, can I get here an amen? Doesn't happen often, but it's a wonderful thing. That, it, different seasons of life, there's different things that are fun for you, but you've got to find those and, and, and walk in those. And I even, uh, I checked the, the publication. That set, I wrote this book 17 years ago called Leadership from the Inside Out. It's all about how pastors and leaders need to take care of their lives to lead for a lifetime. And so I wrote, wrote this almost two decades ago, and here's some of the chapters, okay? I want you to notice this. The leader's heart, how love strengthens every relationship. The leader's mind, you've got to pay attention to that. The leader's ears, listening. The leader, leader's eyes, how vision informs our future. The leader's mouth. And here's chapter 7. The leader's funny bone. How laughter sustains our sanity. In that chapter I say, if I meet a leader who doesn't know how to laugh, I don't totally trust them. Because at some point, they're going to blow up. Because if you don't laugh, if you don't have fun, if you don't decompress a little bit in life, you're, you're going to just, at some point, you're going to lose it. And so... I, I believe that not only is it a biblical reality, but it's a practical reality that we have to grow in every part of our relationship. So today we're talking about a vision for whole relationships in our broken world. And can I tell you, one of the best things you can do in your friendships, in your work relationships, if you're married, if you've got children or grandchildren, is learn to have fun. Make space for fun. It's not all you do. There will still, trust me, there will still be plenty of pain in life that you've got to deal with. But bring a sense of delight and celebration into your relationships. Be that person that when you come in the room, people think, oh, what's going to happen next? You say, well, I'm not wired that way. But God has wired you for delight. And I want you to hear the scriptures, and I want you to see what God has to say. So Psalm 126, 1 through 3, one more time. I read it twice already. It will be up on the screens. The people have been exiled. They went through 70 years of being driven out of their homeland, they're back again, and they're reflecting back and looking at, that was a hard time, but they say, but when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, when God reestablished us in our homeland, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. They were seeing the goodness of God, the presence of God. They were delighting in that. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The world's looking on saying, man, look at these people. Look at these people. All they've gone through with their people of joy. God's done something great for them. And then the people declare, yes, the Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. And then it goes on for three more verses, and you can read that later, uh, of kind of crying out. And so God, restore and continue to bring that joy, that ongoing joy to our lives. Our God is a God of joy. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, many of you know Jesus, many of you walk with Jesus, many of you experience the presence and the goodness and the delight of God's presence in your life, in your home, in your workplace, in everything you do. Some of you are still searching and seeking. You say, man, I don't, I don't have that kind of joy. Let me tell you, it's found in Jesus. Ultimately, all good things are found in Jesus. And so God, our God is a God of joy, and he speaks joy into our lives. In Proverbs 17, 22, and I want you to notice in each passage, there's a, there's a recognition that life is not perfect. There's an acknowledgement that there are hard times. The point of saying, I would never stand here and say, if you're a Christian, you should smile and be joyful all the time and never shed another tear. Praise the Lord. Everything's going to go your way. That's a lie. I wouldn't say that. That's not what the Bible teaches. But I would say this. In the midst of the challenges of life, there's still delight. In the midst of pain and loss and struggles, 
you can still look to God and the people he's put in your life. And there's nothing wrong and shameful about laughing about something even in the mi- middle of a hard time. I mean, it's, a, not, it's inappropriate to do that in the middle of a, you know, sacred moment where people are mourning and you start cracking up. That's not the point. The point is, and as you walk through life, there's a balance. So li- listen to this passage from Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine, and a crushed spirit dries up the bones. There's times where our spirit feels crushed. There's times where we can be filled with cheer. But guess what? A cheerful heart is good medicine. Having a heart filled with cheer, filled with delight, is not just good medicine for you. It's good medicine for all your relationships. It really is. And so so understand that God wants to bring that kind of balance in your life that in the midst of the difficult times that you acknowledge, there's room for cheer. And then that cheer is healing. It's powerful. Ecclesiastes 3, 4. This is a very famous passage that uh, was turned into a song that uh, was uh, uh, big in the the 60s and 70s. Uh, It came out of of this part of the passage. But in Ecclesiastes 3, 4, we read these words. There is a time to weep and a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. The question is, do you know what time it is? Do you recognize in life? If in your mind it's always a time to mourn, then that's going to dry up your soul and the souls of those around you. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to laugh. There's a time, there's a time to celebrate. There's a time to, to dance. There's a time to recognize that t- things can be difficult. And part of our call is to recognize what time we're in. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Sherry and I were in Michigan. We spent a lot of years of ministry there. And one of our dear friends there, somebody who has mentored Sherry for years, uh, her name is Lou, uh, she's lost a husband. She's lost a daughter. And she's lost a granddaughter. She's experienced more familial pain and relational pain than I have in my life. And when we get out in that area, we try to get around Lucille when we can. And we were out there, and, and we actually were driving near where her house was, and Sherry said, we're so near Lou's house. Can we call and see if she's just around? We called, and she was. She answered, how old is Lou right now, Sherry? 92. She's 92. Hey, Lou, can we pop over and say hi? Sure, come on over. How, when will he be here? And I was at four minutes or something. <laughs> but 92. By the time we got there, um, there was lemonade out on a little tray on the porch, and there were some little snacks, and there sat Lou. She didn't know we were coming until we called and said we were coming, and we talked. In those conversations, there can be tears, but there's, there was laughter. There was joy. How you doing? Oh, I've got Jesus. She loves the scriptures. She loves the Lord. Is there heartache and sorrow in somebody who's lost their spouse, a child, and a grandchild? Yeah, that, and you, you don't just take that away. It's not something that ever goes. Ask our team that leads Grief Share here. There's grief you'll carry the rest of your life till you see Jesus face to face. But there can be joy in life in the midst of that. And Lou is such a beautiful example of that reality. Another passage. This was a little bit longer one, but I want you to notice something. In Acts chapter 2, uh, we get this picture of the early Christians and the early church gathering together. And I want you to notice the kinds of things they did, the kinds of things that God's people do when they get together. We have our small group tonight. We're going to be together with a group of people that we're going to do a lot of these things with. We're going to, we're going to share some food. We're going to share some prayer. We're going to share some scripture. We're going to sp- share life together. But this is, the, this is what Christians do when they're together. But I want you to notice not just what the Christians did when they came together, but I want you to notice kind of their, their tone and their spirit. And I want you to notice how other people perceive them. Okay? So listen to this passage from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. They, the early Christians, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching when they would gather, the apostles' teaching to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They shared with each other. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They gathered regularly. They broke bread in their homes. They shared meals together, food together. And they ate with what kind of hearts? Glad and sincere hearts. And what did they do? They were praising God and enjoying, taking joy in the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, the world looks on at a church filled with joy and fellowship and meaning and purpose and love and unity. The world looks on and says, I'm looking for that. And we can then say to them, you know where we found it? In Jesus. 
It's his presence with us. How do you have joy and still celebrate life when you've gone through pain? The presence of Jesus with you. The presence of God Almighty in your heart and in your life. And some of you are in a place of deep loss and deep pain right now. And you say, you know what? I'm not ready yet to break into joy and laughter and celebration. That's okay because there's a time for sorrow and a time for joy. And you may be in a season where you need to, to just be there. And that's okay. But if you say, I'm going to live there the rest of my life, and you know Jesus, you've missed something. You look at the Apostle Paul in prison in the city of Philippi for preaching Jesus. They locked him up. They beat him within an inch of his life and locked him in jail. And late that night, he's still singing songs of praise to God. And a miracle followed, an earthquake. The shackles are broken loose. The guard comes in thinking they've all left because the, in the earthquake, the, the doors were unjarred. They opened it. And the, the, the guard thought he'd lost the prisoners. And in the ancient world, if you lost your prisoners, you were killed immediately. So he took his sword to kill himself. And Paul's still in there. He goes, don't, don't kill yourself. We're still here. None of us have left. You haven't lost a prisoner. Let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> and his joy and his delight and his awareness of God's presence became an open door through that pain to shine the light of Jesus. You don't know what God's going to do through your pain. You don't know what God's going to do through your joy. But there's room for all of these things in the lives of somebody who follows Jesus. So, here's a simple truth. Our God is the most joyful being in the universe. Our God is. If you see God as this killjoy in the sky who's seeking to ruin all your fun, you, don't, you have not met the biblical God. He's not. God brings the greatest joy and celebration. It's God who established all these feasts and festivals. Read the Old Testament sometime. We get to these, these sections on, and now God's going to set up the, you know, the, 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 uh, the festival of tabernacles or booze or the festival of Passover, and you're going to meet at this time, and you're going to have this kind of food, and you're going to do these sorts of things, and, you're gonna, and we sort of like skip over those parts of the Bible, but don't miss those where like over four chapters God explains, hey, and once a year at this time, get together and celebrate. Have lots of food. Remember how I delivered you. Remember how I saved you. Remember how I provided for you. God set up all these festivals and celebrations. It was God who invented Sabbath. He said, okay, every week, seven days, but on the seventh day, take a deep breath. Sabbath, rest. Change the rhythm of your life. Don't kill yourself by working all the time, all the time, seven days a week, but kind of decompress one day a week. God invented all that. And so here's the deal. If our God is the most, most delightful being in the universe, and if we follow him, you know what the most, the most joy-filled, greatest place of celebration in the world ought to be? The church. Of all places in the world. And then our homes where we live should be a place of joy. Yes, of seriousness. Yes, of hard work. But also a place of joy because God is present and God is there. So all through the scriptures, we read of the festivals, the feasts, the celebrations and worship, all instituted by God Almighty, all put in place by his hand. So let me give you some realities and reasons for broken relationships around this topic, around the topic of, of delight and fun and play and joy. Because, and, I, and as I was working on this message and praying through this, and this last week, each day as I was going through the sermon, every day this last week and kind of preparing to share with all of you, it, there was all these pictures that came to my mind of the world we live in. And how joy and delight and celebration is being sucked out of our lives and sucked out of our world. People are so nervous about being canceled or somebody hating them or being mad at them. They just, people are walking in fear. The level of anxiety in our world is going up at a level, I think, unprecedented in history. Especially in, in our culture. And young people, teenagers, and little kids living in anxiety and worry. And God says, I want you to understand that there's reasons for this, and you can recognize these and then turn that upside down and begin to change your life. So here's some of the realities around broken relationships through a lack of joy and celebration. When joy is crushed by seriousness. When joy is crushed by seriousness. So after the service today, if you're on campus here, those that are online, this won't be free, but if you're on campus, out in the courtyard, we've got uh, all kinds of games for kids and stuff. If you've got kids, get them and hang out for a half an hour. 
You know, have a, have a bonus donut with your kid, relax, take a little time, and play a few games and have some fun. And some people go, oh, wait, 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 we're not going to spend time. Wait, when this service is over, go do something productive. What a waste of time just to hang around and just play and laugh and have fun. You know, don't, don't you know that there are starving people in the world? Go do something about it. Well, yes, we do know that. We know there's starving people in the world. And you know, as a church, we have people here every Tuesday and Thursday providing food for those folks. And you guys give in a way that allows us to have food for people every Tuesday and Thursday. You know, there's people that are unclothed. You know, how can you have fun and laugh and smile when there's people that don't have enough? Well, you know, every Tuesday, Thursday, we give away clothes for any men's clothing closet, women's clothing closet. We, we know. We know. But it's okay to have fun. Don't you know there's tension in the Middle East? Wait that smile off your face. It's like, no, is there, does, does anybody not know there's tension in the Middle East? There is. Do we, should we pray? Yes. Should we do all we can to make a difference? Yes. But does that mean that we can now have no joy in life? No. But there's those people who are almost like the, the joyless police. If you start having joy, if you start laughing, you start having fun, they let you know why you shouldn't because of all the bad things in the world. And they crush joy with seriousness. We took a group of people to a conference, uh, the, past, the church I pastored in Michigan. Uh, we took a team of our staff and some volunteers to a conference. I think we had about 12, 15 people going to this conference. And a couple called me from the church before we went to the conference and said, hey, listen, I know that you've got a whole team going to this conference and it's going to be training you to do better, you know, kind of keep doing better ministry in the church and caring for our people. Um, when you're at that conference, this couple said, we want you to go out with a, take the whole group out to a really nice fancy dinner and we want to pay for it. Just give us the bill. We want to just go have fun together. Isn't that great? So some, they had resources. They said, just, we know you're going, do a dinner and have fun. So we go out, we have to a place called Maggiano's. Not super fancy, not super expensive, but like a family-style Italian food. And they, when you order spaghetti, don't order it for you because there's like a plate big enough for five people. And when you, so you order food and you share together. So we go out for this dinner, and we're laughing, and we're having fun. And there's this young woman on our staff, works with the students, scowling at everybody. We're not, we're not, and just, and like, well, what, maybe she's had a hard day. So leave her alone. Food it comes around to her. The server comes to take an order. I don't want anything. And I said, hey, order something. No. And I said to the server, just keep going around the table. And I went over and I kind of went beside this young woman. I said, I said, what's going on? She said, you know, there's starving people in the world right now. We're just sitting here eating pasta and stuff. And I said, I know there's starving people. Order something. Because I'm a pastor and I'm compassionate. And um, <laughs> I said, order something. She said, I don't want to order anything. I don't want to waste the church's money. I said, this isn't the church's money. It's a couple who wants us to have fun. And guess who's ruining everyone's fun? You. I didn't say it. I thought it. Um, <laughs> I was much nicer than that. I'm sure I was, as, as, I, as I recall. Uh, and so I said to the server, go back. And she goes, I want a bowl of noodles with nothing on it. <laughs> if she was, you know, my child, I'd have taken her outside and had a more consequential conversation with her. Um, <laughs> But sometimes joy is crushed by seriousness. And sometimes you're, you, if you're not careful, you could be that person. When, when God is present, when in this broken, hurting world, people are having some fun, don't be the one who takes a bucket of water and pours it on top of everybody. Yes, the world is broken. Yes, there's pain. Jesus came to redeem all that. I'm, my first calling is an evangelist. I want, you, know, you say, well, Kevin, how can you have any fun? There's people that are lost that are, that are, that are going to go be separate from God forever. I know. I spend my life trying to train people all over the world to share their faith in more natural ways. But that doesn't mean I can't enjoy a nice chip that goes in the hole. It doesn't mean I, my wife and I can't sit and play this little dice game that we play in the evenings with like a blue, green, red, yellow. They always roll the wrong numbers and colors. It's just, yeah, but we have fun. And when, so when Sherry got home, we played this Dice game. And then we went about, about our business. That wasn't wasted time. But, those, but, but, but if you're one of those people, if you find yourself getting like that, so aware of what, all that's bad in the world that you're so serious you can't find any joy and delight, you're missing out on some of God's goodness. And maybe for you, the Holy Spirit's just speaking today saying, that's for you. Pay attention. That's for you. When celebration is pushed out by busyness, when we have so much going on, we are so busy that we can't celebrate, Something's wrong. Watch your schedule. Pay attention. Make room. When laughter dies because conflict dominates. You're having a dinner with friends, and everyone's laughing and having a great time. And somebody says, so who are you going to vote for in November? <laughs> Boom, you know. Um, when it's like, those are good conversations to have, but there's a time and a place, right? And, and 
and, and some, some people are going to say, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, some people like to create conflict, create tension. Now, we've got to face the realities of life. But when, when there's a time of delight and joy, just drink it in. Don't be the police to keep people from being joyful. Another problem is when play ceases because work consumes. When our work consumes us and there's no room for play, there's no room for fun, that can be a joy, delight, celebration crusher. And so, what are some pathways to healing, hope, and wholeness? How do we begin to walk into this kind of life that actually honors Jesus and brings him to light? You know, when, when I go golfing with friends, on the first tee, I'll always say, someone pray. And if, if, if there, some aren't Christians, I'll usually pray. And I've, and I've done this with Christians and non-Christians. I always say a prayer. And one of the things I pray is this. Often I pray this. God, as you watch us like your children, taking delight in playing this crazy game, God, will you take delight in your children, taking delight in having fun together? God delights when we delight. God rejoices when we... It's God who created festivals and feasts and ways to remember his goodness. We steal that joy from ourselves. We also steal that joy from God who wants to delight in us. So what are some things you can do? What are pathways to healing, hope, and wholeness? Here's one. Focus on God's restoration and recognize his great works. Notice what God has done. That's what we read in Psalm 126. The Lord has been good to us. And the the nations look and say, yes, the Lord has been good to you. And they say, yes, he has. And And so take time to really look and to see where God is at work and notice that and reflect on that. And let that bring you joy. How has God been at work in your life? What has God done for you? How has God provided? How has God protected you? He has, you just sometimes haven't noticed. Slow down and remember what God has done and that brings joy. Here's another thing we can do. Do a heart check. Check your heart. A cheerful heart is good medicine. Do you carry cheer in your heart? You say, this moment right now, I'm in a time of mourning. That's okay. But are there moments and times where you walk in the room and the room becomes more cheerful because you're there? And that medicine that makes you stronger also makes other people stronger. As a pastor, I get to walk with people through their greatest times of joy and their greatest times of pain. I tell people I have a front row seat to the greatest moments of people's lives and to the worst moments in people's lives. But in those great moments, there's something about rejoicing and celebrating. So check your heart. Will you let yourself celebrate? And maybe your action today is to pray and say, God, I haven't smiled or had cheer in my heart for a long time. And there may be real reasons for that, but God, would you bring back to me, breathe again into me a spirit that after there's restoration, there can be laughter and hope and joy. How do we grow in joy? Know the season and embrace the time. Know the season and embrace the time. If you're in a season of mourning and sorrow and pain, let people walk with you. If you're really in a place where you're saying, I've had deep loss and deep pain, we have a ministry here called Grief Share. It's where people come together and and lift each other's burdens and they they look at solid biblical truths that will help them find joy in the midst of tough times of life. Go to the Connection Center or call the church if you're online and say, when's the next Grief Share gathering? And, and, get it, you know, and, and let people walk with you in that time. But also know that when there's times to celebrate, it's okay to rejoice. It's okay to be cheerful. Yes, there's brokenness in the world, but God is on the throne. He rules and he reigns. How do we grow our joy and our celebration? Step deeply into Christian community. Step into Christian community. You know, Acts chapter 2 is basically we gather with God's people. We're in the word. We're in prayer. We share meals. We share fellowship. Get in a small group. I know I'm going to have a great night tonight. I know without question I'm going to have a great night tonight. Why? Because we're going to begin a a home of a couple from our church who are part of a small group that we've been part of for a year and a half, almost two years. I know who's going to be there. I know we're going to be in the scriptures together. I know we're going to pray. I know we're going to have snacks. I know we're going to hang out. It's going to be a great night. I can predict, not prophetically, but just watching life, we'll probably laugh and tell stories about things in our lives. Connect. If you're not connected with people, other Christians, get connected. Jump into a place of serving in the church because that's in serving where you build more relationships than anywhere else in the church. Get into a group, get into a Bible study, start to serve and build those relationships and that will bring some joy to your life. Here's one more. Plan a party and budget time and money for celebration. Plan to celebrate. I've got a friend of mine who told me years ago, we were talking, he said, and he's, he was a guy who's always kind of doing something special and fun for groups of people, putting things on. And I said, I said what, what, where does that come from? He said, well, when I get paid every two weeks, when I, you know, I, I take 10% of everything I earn and I give it to God's work. First thing, I give it to God's work. 
Then I take another percentage and I set it aside for fun, for celebration, to bless people. So when I have an opportunity to throw a party, put on a dinner, do something, I always have a budget because I put some money aside. I thought, what a crazy guy. <laughs> and then I thought, what a great idea. He plans to celebrate. He plans to have fun. And he does things to help other people do the same. That's medicine to the soul. That's a gift. Does God know that there's pain in, the life, in, the, in this world? Yes. Does God know that there's pain in your life and my life? Yes. Is God still a God who brings joy and delight and celebration? Yes. There's a time and a season. But may God lead you into a season of increasing celebration, delight, laughter, joy in the midst of the challenges of life. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer today. That we would walk in your ways. And God, you are the most joy-filled being in all the universe. You rule and you reign, and oh God, you celebrate. You call us to, to feasts and to festivals. You call us to celebrate. You call us to Sabbath and to rest. And so I pray that every person online today and every person on campus today will draw near to you, will experience your joy and your delight, that we would know that when we delight, when we celebrate, when we have laughter and, and times of great, great joy, that God, you look on like a loving parent and you delight with us. Lord, be with us as we seek to grow each relationship we have by being a bearer of joy and celebration and delight into our relationships. And I pray especially for those, we pray together for those who are hurting and in a dark time of mourning right now. Let them know that, that this may be a season for them where they need to just let their hearts be in that place and let them know that's okay. But would you also let them know that, oh Lord, that when you restored the fortunes of your people, you brought joy and laughter. Will you let them know that though this may be a time for mourning, there will be a day of dancing. There will be a day of celebration. There will be a day of joy. And let them live with that hope while they walk through the difficult times. And Lord, for those who are walking in a season of joy, I pray they, they would not feel guilty, that they would not feel bad about it, but that they would celebrate the good gift of joy that you bring to us. Lord, let us strengthen every relationship we have through letting joy permeate all that we do, we pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Before I invite you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, a couple of things. One, after the service, if you're on campus, out, out in the courtyard, they'll get to the games first. You might have, on your way in, you might have seen all the little game areas. They've got, uh, we've got cornhole, we've got uh, axe throwing, not real axes, they're plastic. We've got all kinds of fun stuff. Hang out with your kids a little bit, spend a little more time, and just visit, meet, make a new friend. Also, today, Sherry, my wife Sherry and I, uh, every so often we'll do a time where we meet new people. We'll be out on the dock over towards where the, where the uh, family worship venue is. Kind of if you go out to the left there. If we've not met you face to face, please jump over there and say hi to us. We'd love to meet you, get, hear some of your story, get to know you. So join us before you leave. If you need prayer for anything, online, live chat and pray. Or send us your prayers by email on campus. Come on up front here in the worship center, and we have teams that would love to pray for you. And if you're new at Shoreline Online, just send the word uh, welcome to the, to the text message, uh, text to the word welcome to the number you see on your screen right now. We want to reach out to get you and get to know you personally. If you're on campus, don't leave today without going to the Connection Center right there in the lobby and just say, hey, we're new to Shoreline, came, just moved, came into the military, just came in for school, just moved here from out of town. We'd love to hear what's going on, and they will help you get connected in the life of Shoreline. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me and give me the privilege of sending you off with a word of blessing. In the midst of a world of challenges and lives that have very real suffering, may you find the joy of Jesus. May you delight in his goodness. May you laugh. May you dance. May you celebrate. And as God watches you, may he delight in your delight. Amen? Have a great day. Go play.